Hello, and uh, welcome to uh, my talk on preverbal particles in Ihanzu, uh, which uh, is given here at the uh, workshop on Bentu in contact with non Bantu languages. So, to start, the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, as conceived by Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse in 2008, is unique on the continent in that it is the only place in which all four of the major African language phyla are um, in contact. So that's Afroasiatic, Khoisan, Niger Congo, and Nilo Saharan, and they have been in contact for a long time. Um, in this same work, the authors identify 19 features, phonological and grammatical, which cut across individual languages and language phyla, and are therefore candidates for examples of aerial convergence. Of these features, one of the most salient and most extensively discussed is that of the preverbal clitic complex, a series of functional particles which occur before the verb and carry out functions commonly conceived as verbal in nature. So this talk examines the functional particles which occur before the verb in Ihanzu. Um, based on newly conducted fieldwork, this talk seeks to add to our empirical knowledge of Ihanzu, an underdocumented language existing on the margins of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, as well as revisit the interesting story of contact as told through these preverbal particles. For some further context, um, I'm an early career researcher and I've been working in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area since 2012 when I began documentary descriptive work with the South Cushitic language, Gorwa. Last summer in 2018, I expanded my scope to begin working with Ihanzu, the Bantu language, which will be the focus of our talk today. And in several months' time, I will begin further documentary descriptive work with Hadza, a language isolate spoken nearby. So essentially my core interests are in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. So Ihanzu, also known as Nihansu or Ihanzu, Isanzu, is a uh, a Bantu language, and it's spoken, li spoken largely in the Mkalama district of Singida region, Tanzania. Um, the traditional homeland of the Ihanzu runs south from the Sibiti River, roughly equivalent here to the thin dashed line running behind the insert map, um, and it continues for about 40 kilometers, blending gradually into communities of Nyilamba people. Ihanzu-speaking communities can be found as far west as the Jeromo River, running almost parallel to a sheer rift valley wall, and probably as far east as Haidom, where communities are mixed with Ihanzu, Iraq, and Atoga speakers. The north-flowing Sibiti empties into Lake Iasi, where Ihanzu speakers and Hadza speakers are in regular contact. It should be noted, however, that the contemporary picture of language contact for Ihanzu is probably not the same model that applied historically, as in, uh, as in the past. Um, communities especially such as Datoga and Iraq were much more mobile in the past. In three dimensions and uh, courtesy of Google Maps moving clockwise with the community of Mkalama as a pivot, one can see a primarily flat land with the dormant volcano Anang rising in the far distance, quite a ways away from any Ihanzu-speaking communities. Um, to the south is a similarly flat uh, area until in the southwest and west we begin to see the rift wall of the Nyilamba Plateau. Finally, as we begin looking to the north, we can see the depression of the Yaeda Valley stretching to Lake Iasi, visible beneath the mountains on the horizon as a pale blue-brown stretch of water. No dedicated language survey has been conducted to determine the number of Ihanzu speakers, but as part of its work on the Language Atlas of Tanzania, the Languages of Tanzania project estimated that in 2009 there were 26,000 Ihanzu speakers in total. Um, how robustly Ihanzu is being passed to children is another question about, what, about which not much is known. So an estimate of speaker figures in 1987 put the total number of Ihanzu speakers at 32,000. 
meaning the new figures represent a reduction of 20% over 20 years. Uh, this is almost certainly too high of an obsolescence rate, as I have observed children in rural areas still continuing to learn and use the language. But with that said, finding speakers in the nearest large town, Singida, is quite difficult, and children of Ihanzu families in this urban environment were not observed to use Ihanzu in most daily interactions, even at home. Anecdotally, Ihanzu speakers commonly talk about their language being subsumed by Nyilamba, a large language which exists side, to, side by side with Ihanzu in southern parts of the Ihanzu-speaking area. Uh, this kind of hearsay lacks rigor but has occurred consistently enough to assume that Ihanzu is under considerable pressure from neighboring Nyilamba. The Ihanzu people have extensive oral accounts of a historical migration to the current homeland and often recall moving south, often through uh, or by Lake Victoria or Lake Nyanza. The relationship with early European colonizers was often one of mutual distrust and hostility, with the Ihanzu taking active roles in regional resistance struggles. The Ihanzu are notable in the Tanzanian Rift Valley in that they are sedentary farmers and see themselves unambiguously as such, as compared to other farming groups who prefer to identify as pastoralists. Um, and they have sorghum and, more recently, maize as important staple crops. Kinship is matrilineal, and residence is, at least early in marriage, matrilocal. Culturally, the Ihanzu are renowned throughout the Rift Valley for their rainmaking uh, abilities an institutionalized practice that continues to this day. Um, modern religions, uh, forms of Christianity and Islam, have had less of an impact here than in other areas in the region, but communities of Christians and Muslims still exist, especially in towns and larger villages. And these new faiths exist simultaneously with traditional faith. So the following is a brief recording of Ihanzu in which Isaac, Isaac Shauri and Musa Gimbi are flipping through photos of birds and describing them to each other. So, a recording of this talk will be available at the following DOI here on the screen, and the video will also be viewable on my YouTube channel. Uh, the majority of the data in this presentation will be openly accessible, both uh, for consultation and use by other researchers. Archiving is not yet complete, so I'll use my completed Gorwa materials as a model. Um, archiving of the Hanzu material should be complete by the end of September of this year. Throughout the presentation, examples will be given with an alphanumeric code to their right, highlighted in red here. Uh, this code consists of two parts divided by a full stop. The part to the left of the full stop refers to the ID of the recording. This can be entered into the search bar of the archive deposit page and will bring you to the appropriate sound, video, and analysis files for the recording. The utterance itself is identified by the number to the right of the full stop, highlighted in red here. It corresponds to the utterance segment number in the ALON file of the corresponding recording. This allows anyone to listen to the utterance as well as examine its wider context. Research and analysis of the Hanzu data was funded by a research fellowship from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, tenured here at the Research Institute for the Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. 
This is a table of Ihanzu verbal morphology, with morphemes apportioned into different slots depending on their ordering and function. As such, the applicative extension morpheme il occurs before the perfect aspect morpheme ile. Some morphemes, such as the object marker series, occur mutually exclusively. That is, no one, no two, uh, no two morphemes can occur uh, at the same time here uh, from this column. Whereas others, such as the applicative and causative extensions, both formally il, may co-occur. So, as an example. Uh, the verb in the utterance uh, below, uh, and we'll play it. Muhomba mekoire imiti. Play it again. Muhomba mekoire imiti. The boy hit the hyena. Uh, it can be broken into a series of verbal prefixes and a series of verbal suffixes, all center around the verb ku, which is to hit. This can be represented in the table as such. Today, our specific focus will be on what I've rather vaguely uh, called the preverbal particles, that is, the three slots which precede the subject marker slot. We'll begin by looking at the slot closest to the subject marking prefixes, here called slot 2. Slot 2 morphemes are tense morphemes developed in addition to the inventory which exists in the two tense aspect slots internal to the verb. As such, our previous example of the boy hit the hyena stands in contrast to uh, this example. We'll play it. Uh, this form uh, with the slot two morpheme ali, the boy hit or had hit the hyena. Schematically, this would look something like this. In addition to the morpheme ali, uh, slot 2 is also occupied by the morpheme aza, which yields a form like this. The boy hit the hyena. This would be represented schematically as such. You'll see here that the translations given here aren't entirely satisfactory. Indeed, one would expect that these two morphemes, Ali and Aza, are expressing something like degrees of past. In fact, at this point, it's, there's just not enough evidence to convincingly characterize either. So when examining their co-occurrence with different terms for time, as well as the verb internal past marker, A, there is no convincingly strong pattern to call one a remote past and one a near past, for example. What is clear, however, is that both carry some connotation of past, as uh, neither can occur with the adjective uh, mudao, which is tomorrow. More semantically discernible is the single morpheme occupying slot 1. This form is quite ambiguous, unambiguously a relative marker, as can be seen in the meaning contrast between the first form, the boy hit the hyena, and this one. Which means the boy who hit the hyena. Schematically, this would be represented uh, as here. The relative in slot 1 can freely join with tense markers from slot 2, such as the form uh, here. The boy who hit the hyena, represented schematically as such. Subject and object relative functions are both accomplished using the slot 1 relative, but by manipulating constituent order. Compare the above form, umuhumba uh, numikwile mpiti, the boy who hit the hyena, to uh, the one below, mpiti umuhumbo nalumikwile, the hyena that the boy hit. The slot 1 relative is also frequently used in adjectival constructions, so compare the above form with the form below. So we have umuhumba numulipu azumikwile mpiti, the boy who is tall hit the hyena, and umuhumba mulipu ukumiku mpiti, which is the tall boy hit the hyena. Um, interestingly, in all of my data, which is primarily elicitation, it is the relativized form which is considerably more frequent than the form with the adjective only. 
The forms singa and shanga are negatives, so thus we have an utterance like this. He is not hitting a hyena, and represented schematically as such. Thus far, I have not determined the difference between these two forms. We therefore have singa and shanga occurring in what seems to be free variation. So this is an example by the same speaker using shanga in a vaguely uh, similar context to the example above. And this would be represented schematically as such. As we can see with the previous example, the shanga or singa negative marker combines freely with the slot to tense markers. Another example is here. Which means something like the men wouldn't have hit the hyena. And this is represented schematically as such. Similarly, we can see the slot one relative combining to give a form like the hyena that the boy didn't hit, now containing all three of the preverbal slots we have examined, and represented schematically as such. However, consider the one example displayed here. The hyena that I didn't hit, in which, instead of slot 1, negative, slot 2 ordering, we find slot 1, slot 2, negative ordering. It should be noted, however, that this is the only instance of this ordering I have in the corpus, so may very well be a hapax legomenon. With that said, the corpus itself is still small, and the total number of examples I have featuring all three slots is very small indeed. So schematically, the form would be represented as follows, but with the proviso that the negative slot and slot 2 may not be strictly fixed or templatic in relation to each other. This is obviously interesting because it makes them just that little bit more clitic-like rather than ethics-like. Having considered the empirical facts, the first question must be, why is this interesting? Um, and the short answer is that it may allow us to tell a contact story, uh, that is, to infer language contact based on shared features between, in this case, unrelated languages. So what follows will examine this notion in detail. In the seminal work on sustained and diverse language contact in the Tanzanian Rift Valley, Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse 2008 identify 19 features, phonological, morphosyntactic, and semantic, which are so widespread that they may be candidates for aerial features. One of these is the existence of a preverbal clitic complex, in the most basic sense a series of functional particles which occur before the verb and carry out functions commonly conceived as verbal in nature. Based on evidence from Nyilamba, F31 Bantu languages were valued as having this aerial feature. Using the data that we have just examined, we will now evaluate this claim for the other F31 Bantu language, obviously Ihanzu. Uh, so disregarding the final three languages in this table, Swahili, Maasai, and Oromo, included as control languages, uh, we can see that the preverbal clitic complexes are widespread throughout languages of the area. In fact, except for the F33 and F34 Bantu languages, Rangi and Mbugwe, every language has been valued as having preverbal clitic complexes. This includes the Toga varieties, the Bantu language Nyaturu, uh, the language isolate Hadza, the Khoisan language Sandawe, and perhaps most characteristically the South Cushitic languages Iraq, Gorwa, Alagwa, and Burungay. And because it is these South Cushitic languages that provide the archetype for preverbal clitic complexes in the area, and because Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse assumed that these were the structures uh, that influenced F31 Bantu, including Ihanzu, we will now examine these structures in one South Cushitic language with, with which I am familiar, Gorwa. For some very brief context, Gorwa is spoken in and around Babati by around 133,000 people. For comparison, Ihanzu is spoken in an area covered by the upper left circle, though note uh, that Gorwa and Ihanzu speaker communities do not border on each other, as the circles would indicate here. Uh, they don't border on each other, and they don't uh, frequently interact 
today. Uh, the following is a short recording of Akobu Sahuare talking about farming sisal when he was young. It's an example of Gorwa. <laughs> So one of the most salient characteristics of Gorwa, and indeed of all of southern Cushitic, uh, and the one that we are focusing on in this talk is the existence of obligatory uh, clitic complexes, separable from the verb, but which carry out many functions associated with the verb. In Gorwa, the preverbal clitic complex marks mood, voice, all core arguments, aspect, and several adverbial notions. A basic example is the form ngina in our pet example, the boy hit the hyena. Play it again. In this case, ngina is conveying information that the predicate is in indicative mood, active voice, the agent of the transitive verb is third person, the patient of the transitive verb is feminine, and the aspect is imperfective. Um, in a richer example here, uh, the preverbal clitic uh, complex misna tells us that the predicate is in questioning mood, active voice, the agent of the transitive verb is third person, the patient of the transitive verb is feminine, the aspect is perfect, and that there is a reason involved. And note too that in this case, probably due to phonological constraints, the reason morpheme does not occur at the very end of the uh, clitic complex, but before the argument marking. A further example, we'll play it. I hit the cow shows the object le, intervening between the clitic complex and the lexical verb. So this separability shows us that the clitic cluster or the clitic complex is in a way independent of the lexical verb. And it was this kind of Gorwa-like model that came to mind when Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse examined the verbal template in Nyaturu, the F32 Bantu language, here in their sample. Essentially, it was a language employing a series of clitics to accomplish functions of the verb. Uh, in this example, we see the relative marker, far past, and persistive marked outside of the verb. Note as well that the persistive form also bears a uh, separate subject agreement marker. Uh, in a further example, uh, we can see the subject intervening between the clitic cluster and the verb. Returning to Ihanzu, our language of interest for this talk, a comparison proves useful. So concentrating again on those slots which occur before the subject marker and simplifying the schematic, we get something that looks like this. And calling up the analog for nyaturu, uh, we can make a comparison of preverbal clitic material that looks like this. One immediate difference is the existence of a slot for the negative morpheme in Ihanzu, but not in nyaturu. As we've seen in nyaturu, negation is accomplished by a morpheme occurring after the subject marker. We can also observe some morphemes which are most probably cognates, including the slot 1 relative and the slot 2 morpheme, which we've called past 3 in Ihanzu. We can also see that Nyaturu has a slot 3 examined a, a bit earlier above, which to present we cannot see in the Ihanzu data. So starting with slot 2, we can see that both are homologous in that they are both tenth slots, 
though the range of particles available in Yaturu is considerably more rich than in Ihanzu. Um, these are essentially morphemes that function in addition to the verb internal tense markers. Ihanzu past two and three build on verb internal past one morpheme, uh, and the pattern is similar in Yaturu. However, where all of the particles in Ihanzu can be traced to Bentu morphemes, so both Ali and Aza are common morphemes in a wide range of other Bantu languages, Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse identify three slot two morphemes in Yaturu that are ostensibly Kushitic for past and near future, or whose origin is unclear, uh, the example being the future two marker Equi. Um, note, however, that this form, Equi, a slot two future marker, may possibly have a cognate in Ihanzu, the future tense marker Ika, which occurs internal to the verb in the tense aspect slot following the subject marker. As noted, the slot 1 relatives in Ihanzu and Yaturu are clearly cognate. What is perhaps more interesting is determining where this form originates. We see in Ihanzu the structure the boy who hit the hyena, where this N marks the beginning of the relative clause. Um, quite strikingly, uh, the ni in this gorwa example is used to mark a relative clause where the subject is first person. So we see ni marking uh, a relative clause here in gorwa. Um, the similarities in these preverbal particles is clearly worth some further investigation. Um, so first option is that this morpheme is a borrowing from bantu into gorwa or its predecessor language or languages, which in the literature is called Proto-West Rift. Uh, this, however, is highly doubtful as the same N morpheme is found doing the same work in Harar Oromo, a geographically distant but genetically related lowland East Cushitic language. A second option is that this morpheme is a borrowing from Southern Cushitic into Bentu, though this is not surefire as Ni is a copular form widespread throughout the Bantu languages of the area whose adaptation into a relative marker seems to be a, a plausible grammaticalization path. So with these options considered, the chance that the forms are similar by coincidence is not impossible. After all, an alveolar nasal plus high front vowel combination is not at all rare or marked. The fact that Nyaturu possesses a third preverbal particle slot versus Ihanzu, which does not, is probably valid, but worth further scrutiny. It should be noted that these morphemes, carrying a sequential and persistive meaning, would seem to show up in narrative genres, precisely the kind of genres that the current Ihanzu data lacks. So as such, this may or may not be a quirk of the sample and needs further documentation, specifically of natural speech genres, to verify. Um, so I'll start my conclusion uh, by one of Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurses, that it is relatively clear that the Nyaturu preverbal clitic complex was adopted from or influenced by ref West Rift Cushitic structures. In Ihanzu, the evidence for analogous contact is less clear. This is due to Ihanzu's lack of structures of convincing Cushitic provenance, as well as the overall paucity of preverbal particles in comparison to Nyaturu. The contact stories proposed for Nyaturu by Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse is that either Nyaturu was once used by a group of bilingual West Rift Cushitic speakers, or that the Nyaturu were once bilingual in West Rift Cushitic themselves. Ihanzu contact stories would have to be modified as follows. So either one of the above situations applied, and then Ihanzu became less like Nyaturu and West Rift, perhaps through a process of convergence as discussed by Martin for example, um, or that none of the above situations applied, and then Ihanzu became more like West Rift through contact with Nyaturu only. And, of course, the possibility, however slight, of chance uh, resemblance can never be ruled out. So, pathways to a further understanding of Ihanzu as a language and the contact stories that it holds exist largely in examining other areas of the language, including the grammar writ large, the lexicon, the pragmatics, and its linguistic arts, including oral history. 
um, as well as building a corpus that captures these modalities in a rich and nuanced way, so a corpus that is large, diverse, and representative of natural speech. These are my references, uh, and thank you very much.